So we are live and it's recording. So let me start by um, thanking uh, Frank Richter and Horacis for allowing us to host this um, very interesting uh, panel um, today. Uh, are you able all to hear me? Yes. Yes. And to all of you distinguished uh, panelists, they say that diplomatically the most important postings in the world are Washington, London, Brussels, Moscow, and Beijing, especially when it comes to the Middle East. So our four ambassadors here today have in aggregate more than 100 years experience of diplomatic uh, uh, participation involving the Gulf, North Africa, and Levant, and we are extremely honored to have them. Also, we have on the panel two senior UK diplomats with significant diplomatic and intelligence experience in and about the Middle East. Welcome to you all and thank you for uh, sparing your time and, and sharing your experiences with Horace's um, today. Um, I would like to start by setting the context, if I may. Um, and after that, we will have um, each panelist express uh, or respond to a question that um, I will put to the panelist. As we all know, the Middle East is in a state of flux at the moment. Conflicts continue and the number of failing states, sadly, is on the increase. Um, it is viewed uh, that the West is increasingly important and one could say that even the U.S. is in withdrawal from its historically very deep engagement in the Middle East. Does this therefore mean a greater role for the UK, for Russia, for China? Can they effectively fill this vacuum that the US could leave behind? Um, it's worth to note that the UK's recent strategic integrated review only paid lip service in three paragraphs involving the Middle East. Most of the focus was on um, the uh, Far East and China. The world is also going through climate change and there will be a massive impact of decarbonization and the um, consequences of the climate change movement. What is the Middle East doing in terms of diversifying its economic base and moving away from hydrocarbons? COVID-19, mass youth unemployment, and the recently announced tax on global corporates will also have a significant impact on the Middle Eastern economies. We also have witnessed recently a change in the nature of warfare. Asymmetric warfare is now the new standard whereby cyber, germ warfare, and drones will be the weaponry of the future. In light of this, what's the whole point of all the fuss on the Iran JCPOA? Is it redundant on the basis that no one who strikes first will necessarily win a conflict? There is also, as we have seen, continuous interference and meddling by non-Arab powers be they the West, Russia, China, Israel, Iran, Turkey, into the affairs of the Arab states. Can this ever be made to stop and how? Is it possible ever to achieve Arab unity? Even the GCC is broken and the OIC is largely ineffective. And can peace ever be conceived between neighbors such as Saudi Arabia and Iran and Israel and Palestine. And finally, water scarcity, is this likely to be the cause of the next conflict? I could go on and on. As you can see, the themes are complex and they are all very live and current. Let me start by asking Clovis Smith Baker, has the Middle East in your experience ever been so fragmented? How much is UK responsible, if at all, for the current state of affairs and can the UK help to fix it, Clovis? Well, thank you very much, Mohammed, for those very straightforward questions. My short answer to has the Middle East ever been so fragmented uh, is uh, yes. Uh, there has always been, it's always been a region of shifting alliances and interests. If you go back to the Ottoman Empire, uh, that was a fragmented period when the Ottomans were repressing independence movements. Uh, if you go back more recently, just to the post-Second World War, 
uh, the establishment of Israel was a fragmenting uh, event. Uh, then the Cold War uh, made the Middle East a battleground or a cold battleground between the US and the West and the USSR. And that seems to have gone away. Uh, then we had pan-Arabism in the 1950s and 60s, uh, which was a different sort of fragmentation. When that failed to defeat Israel in 67, it kind of withered a bit. Uh, and we have pan-Islamism uh, from the 1970s on. But then that morphed uh, at the extreme end into Islamist uh, extremism and terrorism. So I think it's always been uh, very fragmented, but the fragmentations change. If you think about countries, uh, the Iran-Iraq war, 1980s to 88, was a very long war, very bloody, very disruptive, horrible. Now Iran and Iraq effectively are allies of a sort. If we think about the relationship between Turkey and Israel, in the 1990s, they were always strategic partners. Uh, and now uh, Turkey hosts Hamas. If we think about the GCC, uh, at one point it seemed uh, quite unified. And then there's been this uh, row with Qatar between uh, well, just over now, from 2017 until now. If we think about Libya, it's uh, almost split into, into two countries, each side supported by different powers, including regional powers. So uh, I, I don't think it's, uh, it's particularly new. And in fact, there is a Wikipedia page, which is called List of Conflicts in the Middle East. And that will tell you about all sorts of other conflicts, uh, which I haven't mentioned, uh, and, and essentially is a very difficult uh, region. And so it's not new, the fragmentation. The actual uh, shame of it is then, how much is the UK responsible for the current state of affairs? Well, we often get the blame uh, in the Middle East for, for all sorts of things, in particular the borders. But I would just say that countries are not like people. So uh, countries change and governments change. And uh, you can't really blame the current uh, lot of people running the UK or running UK foreign policy for what their predecessors did a uh, 100 years ago. So with that proviso... Uh, if we think about how this all happened, uh, up until the First World War, UK policy for the, the so-called Eastern question uh, was not to stimulate the collapse of the Ottoman Empire because we foresaw that the collapse of the Ottoman Empire would lead to all sorts of difficulties, uh, as indeed it did. And then uh, at the beginning of World War I, the UK tried very hard uh, to persuade Turkey or the Ottoman Empire to be on the Allied side. It was touch and go. And uh, it, eventually the, the uh, Ottoman government decided to become an ally of, of Germany. But can you imagine how different the Middle East would be if the Ottomans had been allied with the British instead of their enemies? Uh, as a consequence of the, of the First World War, uh, we get a lot of blame for the Sykes-Picot Agreement in 1916, which was a, a secret agreement between the British and French about how to uh, carve up the Ottoman Empire at, at the end of the war. Sykes-Picot is really just shorthand for a whole load of negotiations which took place, and the original Sykes-Picot diagram isn't, isn't what eventually happened. Uh, and so this, this went on with the Italians getting stuff, the Russians and so on. Uh, it was in, uh, imposed, my excuse would be for the British would be, this was wartime. Uh, that's what happens in wars. Big changes happen. Uh, and uh, I'd also say that national boundaries weren't necessarily so, as important as they are today. So you look, if you look at 19th century maps of the Middle East, uh, particularly in the Gulf, they show uh, towns and ports and oases. Uh, but they don't show anything in the desert because who cares about the desert? And, and the Bedouin wander about the desert and they're, they're not bound by, by borders. And there weren't very many roads either. So there was no road between Baghdad and the, and the Mediterranean. Uh, and the role of the state was much less. States were, did defence and law, but they didn't really do much uh, in the way of education, healthcare and so on. So nationality was uh, less important. And, and finally, on the borders, 
if you look at a, an ethnic or sectarian map of the demographics of the Middle East, you'll see it's so mixed that wherever you draw the boundaries, you're going to cut through some ethnic or, or sectarian group. So, for example, the Kurds are all over the place and they don't have a, a national home. Uh, and the other thing about the First World War was the Balfour Declaration, of course, in 1917. Again, a wartime measure which Britain felt obliged to carry out in order to uh, secure funding uh, and to try and win the war. So it wouldn't have happened uh, without the First World War. So having said all that, I think we have a mixed record. Um, and so Palestine, uh, effectively, we had the mandate from 1920 to 48. But effectively, we gave up. In 1947, we had 100,000 troops in uh, what's now Palestine and, and Israel. Uh, and there was only a population of 2 million. So we, that's a lot of uh, uh, troops. And then we couldn't uh, solve the Palestinian question uh, with that much force. And, and we gave up. Uh, in Iran, uh, we backed the Shah in the 1953 coup. Uh, that seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, long term, probably a bad thing to do. And then as you become, as you get more recent, I think our record gets better. So in Oman, uh, we helped uh, the uh, change of Sultan and the, and the new Sultan, Qaboos, who's just died. Uh, and we secured Oman as a state by supporting Omani forces in a counterinsurgency campaign. So I think we've got a good record there. And, uh, and uh, with the independence of the Gulf states, again, we didn't fight that. We, we went out quietly. Uh, the first Gulf War, uh, we fought for the liberation of Kuwait. And in fact, Mrs. Thatcher stimulated the then President Bush uh, to take this invasion of Kuwait by Iraq uh, seriously. Uh, question, did we do the right thing at the end of that first Gulf War? by not getting rid of Saddam, should we have taken that responsibility? At the time, people thought we should have done. But if we see what's happened in the second Gulf War, maybe we were right not to. Uh, and uh, then the uh, Iraq invasion of Iraq in 2003, where Tony Blair went all in with the Americans. Uh, Saddam was a bad man. He's gone. His horrible regime has gone. Uh, Iraq, the population of Iraq has self-determination. Is that a good thing? Theoretically, yes. Uh, but was the human cost of the intervention in Iraq worth it? And I think only history will tell uh, on that. Can the UK uh, help fix it? Well, um, I, I think whatever we do seems to be the wrong thing. So when we intervened uh, on a large scale in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, that didn't work. When we intervened, kind of half intervention, uh, as in Libya, where we had the air campaign, uh, that didn't work. That hasn't resolved Libya's issues. And when we didn't intervene, as in Syria, uh, that hasn't worked either. Uh, and Syria is a mess. So it's, it's not clear to me at all uh, that what, what, what we should do in terms of use of, of military of military hard power. And this is against a background where others are intervening. So the Russians are intervening uh, with hard power. Uh, the Iranians are intervening with hard power. And other regional states uh, are intervening with hard power. I think we've seen the limits of hard military power. And the, besides the UK experience in Afghanistan, we've also got the Saudi experience in Yemen. Uh, which hasn't been, hasn't been great. Uh, people talk about soft power and uh, endlessly going on about how Britain has got a lot of soft power. That's fine, but it's very indirect. You can't use soft power to persuade uh, two countries to resolve their issues. That's not how it works. It's a very long-term, slow influence of, of soft power. Uh, and then people talk about our, our influence over the, the Americans. I think that's uh, overstated. Uh, the Americans are clearly pivoting to Asia for all sorts of good reasons from their national interest uh, point of view. Uh, and we, we, can have a, we, have, we can talk to them, have their ear, and they respect our opinions and so on, but we can't deliver uh, the Americans uh, on the whole. 
So what, what should the UK do about this? And I think it boils down to alliances. Uh, and when every country is, is just going after its own interests and is uh, fighting with each other, metaphorically speaking, uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to resolve any issues. Uh, it's all about alliances. And that's where uh, diplomacy comes in. And I know Jamie's going to talk about this at the end. Uh, but I think the, the key thing for us, for the UK, is to have strong alliances in the region and to have some hard power, but only to use that in a very limited way and as a last resort. So I think I've gone on probably over my time. So I'll hand back to you, Mohammed. Thank you very much, Clovis. I'm sure that there will be some follow-up questions, but let me just go through all our distinguished guests first and then we revert to you. So, um, Ambassador Tariq Adel, um, Egypt has been the mainstay of the Arab world um, for a long time, but more recently it has stayed out of the limelight, which may not be so bad a thing. However, in the last few days, as we've seen, during the 11-day war between Israel and the Hamas, Egypt played a very big role in brokering a ceasefire between Hamas and Israel. Please enlighten us on the pivotal role that Egypt played in this process, and can we see this as a revival of Egypt and its engagement more actively in Arab affairs? Thank you, uh, Mohammed, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, uh, I would like to start off by saying that uh, Egypt uh, has and will always uh, uh, continue to play a pivotal role uh, regionally uh, and maybe beyond. Uh, and for many reasons, uh, one of which, of course, is uh, for uh, geopolitical uh, realities. Uh, and this is why Egypt uh, continues to play a, a, a role in many uh, issues. Uh, or crisis that uh, faces the uh, Middle East. You have mentioned uh, the uh, latest uh, round of escalation uh, that took place uh, between the Israelis and the Palestinians uh, in Gaza. Uh, and Egypt, of course, uh, immediately uh, got involved in trying to uh, broker a ceasefire agreement. Uh, we were able to, uh, to do this uh, and by the way, this is not the first time uh, we uh, broker such a ceasefire agreement. We have done this in the past, uh, last of which was in uh, 2014. Uh, this time around, uh, uh, the situation, of course, is, uh, is different. Uh, the reasons for the uh, outbreak uh, uh, of hostilities are different. However, uh, we still, uh, we were able uh, through our contacts and our envoys that visited uh, Gaza, Ramallah and Tel Aviv, we were able to uh, uh, broker a ceasefire agreement. Now, the important thing right now is to make sure that this fire, uh, ceasefire agreement uh, holds. Uh, and secondly, uh, start uh, uh, reconstruction efforts and coordinate efforts for uh, reconstruction in Gaza. Gaza, uh, in the last round of escalation, has been uh, uh, destroyed uh, quite heavily. So uh, the reconstruction efforts uh, uh, will have to be managed in a way in order to uh, uh, bring back uh, the situation as it were before the latest escalation, but also to, to, to improve the situation. Now, thirdly, uh, this is not an end in itself. Uh, uh, of course, the, uh, the, uh, the main objective or, uh, should be, and uh, at least for us, is to uh, settle uh, in a just and comprehensive manner the uh, question of Palestine. Uh, and I think the uh, latest uh, round of, uh, of, uh, of violence has uh, proved yet again that ignoring the Palestinian issue uh, does not make it get away. You know, uh, 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 it, is, uh, it is there uh, and it has been there uh, uh, for many decades uh, and it will continue to be there. Uh, many of us in the region uh, uh, continue to believe, and this is not cliche, that the uh, uh, ills of the Middle East stem 
from the unresolving uh, uh, from unresolving the uh, Palestinian uh, issue. So I think uh, what we need to do, uh, and this is uh, where Egypt is engaged right now, is to try to uh, bring back the parties to the negotiating table. Uh, uh, the international community will have to come up with a, uh, uh, with a way to seriously address uh, uh, this situation because uh, uh, we don't know uh, if God forbid uh, uh, another uh, escalation takes place, uh, where would that uh, lead us? So we need to uh, deal with the Palestinian issue. And I think the United States uh, uh, administration realizes that it cannot uh, uh, afford to uh, leave the Palestinian issue unresolved in such a way. Uh, the Palestinian issue may not have been uh, a priority for the uh, new administration, but I think uh, uh, what has happened lately has shown uh, not just to the uh, American administration, but I think to the whole world, that uh, uh, we should uh, also address uh, uh, the Palestinian issue as we are addressing the, uh, uh, the Iranian uh, nuclear uh, file, uh, Libya, Iraq, uh, Syria. And I think uh, uh, it won't do anyone any good if we uh, uh, leave the Palestinian question unresolved. Uh, you know, it's, it's, we, 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 we can... Uh, use some uh, treatment uh, to, uh, to treat the uh, current illness of the, uh, of the crisis. However, we need a long-lasting uh, uh, resolution to the crisis. Uh, there is uh, a problem of occupation, and uh, that will only be corrected when the occupation uh, uh, is gone. Uh, I will leave it at this. Uh, maybe uh, uh, I'll have... Uh, something to say on what Clovis said earlier regarding the uh, 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 boundaries uh, in the Middle East, uh, uh, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll leave it for later. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Mansour, uh, UAE has made enormous strides in attracting FDI, with Dubai Expo 2020-2021, diversifying its economy. We saw the announcement by Abu Dhabi yesterday that it wished to spend $6 billion now in the arts and culture space. They are giving citizenship and long-term visas now to attract residencies and businesses to set up in the UAE. And it seems, if one reads today's Financial Times, that there is a refocus away from conflicts and into engaging with the world and the Middle East in an economic way and hoping that that will be the precursor to solving some of these conflicts. Um, and of course, the leadership, and I know from my own residency there, has been visionary, has been transformational in many ways. In your view, is this the way forward? Um, alongside the soft power that Lois talked about earlier for deeper and sustainable engagement in the Middle East. Uh, thank you, Mohammed. Uh, it's an honor really to be able to address Harassus Global uh, uh, and such a distinguished uh, uh, panel. Uh, particularly thank you, Mohammed, for the invitation and Dr. Richter, but Mohammed, uh, uh, Conservative Friends of Middle East, uh, Jamie and Clovis. Uh, I think if we take a look at sort of the UAE's, uh, I'll be able to answer your question, but if we take a look at the UAE's handling of the pandemic, um, you know, and really leading the global restart to, to, to open the world uh, and continue doing business, it, it sort of is very reflective of how the UAE deals with crisis in the region. Um, so it's one of the few countries really to open and has stayed open whilst allowing travel and trade uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, so we really feel that openness uh, and safety with, with the pandemic can be achieved, um, you know, and it's one that the UA has shown that it can, it can manage. Um, we were one of the first countries really to start in the mid-2020 with our recovery plans uh, and get things back on track uh, for a robust growth in 2021, as economic indi indicators are showing. 
for us, the pandemic has really highlighted the, the, the preparedness, agility and consistency of the UAE to be able to manage such a crisis effectively. And a lot of that goes back to uh, the measures we took and investments that we, we put in place pre-COVID. So when, when you talk about sort of heavily investing in infrastructure, that prepared us to tackle this crisis. We were always investing in the healthcare sector and health infrastructure. Um, we have smart cities and digital infrastructure. Um, so the transition to the online was seamless for us. Um, we've been investing in food security for a long time, uh, as well as our, our, our commitments to logis logistics as a hub uh, for the region. So we didn't experience any shortage uh, during the pandemic. And that has enabled trade uh, and now, uh, more importantly, vaccine flow uh, throughout the world, which we're proud to be able to support. So we believe, you know, as, as a beacon of hope within the region, if you have the right in infrastructure, you can be swift in your response. Uh, and that's given us, as I was saying, the agility to open up, but tighten as needed. Um, and all underpinned by accountability. Um, you know, there's a lot that we've learned from this crisis when we talk about the pandemic. Um, you know, and it's one that continues to challenge us. But uh, as, a, as a, a very strong economy in the region, we can be forward leaning. Um, and we're looking, we're looking to be able to connect back with, with other countries and other economies because it will take all of us uh, to overcome this crisis and really connect back the global economy. But from the UAE perspective, as you were saying in your, your comments when you introduced me, um, it's our 50th uh, year anniversary this year and we celebrate that on the 2nd of December. We also will be hosting Expo in October. Uh, and so we really look forward to welcoming the world uh, as different countries open up. But, you know, how that sort of model, um, how has the, when, when we talk about the, uh, the economics of it, which I think is really what your question uh, was asking, um, you know, how has the UAE been able to achieve this? I think I should set out some of those uh, sort of key enablers of business and success for the UAE, which a lot of um, the panel and our, and our listeners will know already. But we've always believed that a favorable low tax environment has has sort of uh, stimulated prosperity and economic growth. When we talk about tax residency for individuals and corporate entities uh, that choose to reside in the UAE, uh, that can benefit from our tax treaties uh, and free trade agreements. We also are a country that's quite unique in having um, a network of tax treaties. Um, so, you, you know, we have um, a zero income tax um, is one of the few countries in the world, the UAE, is actually to have zero income tax with an extensive range of uh, these tax, tax treaties, uh, something like 117 double tax treaties, um, which is one of the highest in the world. I mean, to put it in perspective, um, uh, that's much higher than, say, Singapore or Switzerland would have, and even Liechtenstein, which is considered very uh, prestigious jurisdiction. Moving to foreign ownership, we now offer 100% foreign ownership, um, you know, and that's decreed by law uh, for commercial companies uh, can own up to 100% foreign ownership. Um, you know, and that's free zones. We're already offering this in the UAE, but we've extended this onshore uh, to investors. And we, we, we expect that sort of foreign investment uh, will exceed 35% as a result of these amendments. We currently have about 300,000 companies operating in the UAE uh, and the Ministry of Economy is targeting 1 million within 10 years. We're seeing our free zones, which have been part of the sort of landscape and fabric of the UAE uh, and its sort of commercial success. But we're seeing rapid growth, uh, uh, robust growth of companies opening more uh, within our free trade zones, uh, including our financial um, uh, free trade zones like the DIFC, because we have the regulation and we have agreements with, with other jurisdictions. Um, but to your question, in terms of sort of the very um, uh, sort of interesting development in terms of long term residency, uh, you know, it's one that the UAE has always believed in uh, having a very liberal policy of attracting people to, to live and reside within uh, the UAE. But we're offering long term residency programs, 10 years, five years, uh, for example, the golden visa uh, that we offer um, to, to investors um, for a minimum amount of, it's north of $500,000, but also for specialist talents. Um, so uh, people recognize for specialist talents in inventors, uh, proponents of knowledge, um, medicine, science, research, culture, 
art and sports. Um, so uh, not just the science side of things, science profession, but also the culture and art scene that we see as key. And you mentioned in your opening comments uh, to, to creating that creative economy uh, and knowledge-based econom economy. Uh, important things, um, privacy, um, we offer, uh, you know, we're one of the few uh, remaining ju jurisdictions really to, to offer um, important privacy uh, for, for investors and people that reside within the, uh, within the UAE. Um, back to one of our, our sort of historical um, uh, uh, features, but location, you know, Dubai International, go, going back to the D Dubai Creek, um, you know, and our sort of uh, trade with the region through our Dow, historical sort of Dow routes, trading routes. But, you know, Dubai International Airport now um, is one of the busiest airports in the world. And in, in 2019, had 86 million passengers through it. Um, you know, and serves over 90 airlines. So being a global hub is another aspect that we see as a, a formula for su success in the region. Also back to the most important things, and colleagues have, have mentioned that already, uh, um, uh, His Excellency Tara, um, but stability, providing the stability that we need when it comes to our economy, our currency and our government um, is, is so critical. Uh, and that's supported by state-of-the-art infrastructure, um, when you look at sort of uh, indexes and, and ratings, recognized ratings in the world, the World Economics uh, competitive, uh, Competitiveness Report, um, uh, you know, all those things, the UAE in the region sort of tops the charts. Um, so it's one that leadership has put a lot of weight into investing in. Um, and, and uh, you know, we, we, we rank number one in the Middle East um, uh, for ease of doing business uh, by the World Bank. But we've also extended that to other important areas like our ESG framework, launching a very progressive ESG framework um, where we have uh, our law stipulates equal pay for women and men in the UAE. Uh, and, you know, a third of our, our, our cabinet are female ministers. Uh, so it's one that uh, our FNC, Federal National Council. So inclusivity is a big is a big area. But we've also been very successful um, at attracting top flight, flight professionals, you know, because of the quality of life and the, the attractiveness of the destination of the UAE uh, to live and work. Um, if we look ahead, uh, and I won't go on to, for too long, appreciate other, other colleagues have to speak, but um, looking ahead to 2022, uh, we're expecting full recovery in terms of GDP, um, you know, and, and a lot of a spate of uh, forward-looking strategies have been launched. I can reference a few examples, the Bioburn pa Plan 2040, which is set to make Dubai one of the best places to live, um, you know, and, and doubling our tourism infrastructure. Uh, and then we've had a strong push um, in terms of industrial strategy, launching a very ambitious industrial strategy uh, that will see huge spending on research and de development uh, to boost our industrial sector and, 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 and future-proof it. Um, we continue to trade is a key feature. Uh, uh, and I think the key takeaway uh, from this is that, you know, the UAE uh, will stay its course, will stay its path. There's no slowing down and we want to keep moving ahead. And as you were saying, um, you know, we look forward to welcoming the world in, 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 20, in October to Expo, um, you know, and we, we're confident that we'll host an event that makes set, six, uh, sense in a post-COVID world. Um, but the UAE will continue to play its role as a beacon of hope. Um, and I can talk a lot about tolerance and inclusivity uh, you know, all that, that aspect, I'm happy to answer more questions later. But I think most of all, we see uh, this discussion and we see Expo and our position in the region and the world as an opportunity to reshape, reshape the future. And thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Abu Hul. It's a very optimistic um, view and uh, one that I think all of us should definitely um, subscribe to as well. Uh, I will now turn to His Excellency Omar Nahar, um, Ambassador of uh, Jordan to the United Kingdom. Uh, Omar, um, you said that His Majesty has been the anchor of stability in the Middle East and a dear friend to all. How will Jordan continue to cope with the strain of Syria and Iraqi instability and the influx of refugees on the one hand and the failure to find a permanent solution and homeland for the Palestinians. It's a very tough, uh, tough order. Thank you so much, uh, Mohammed. Uh, good afternoon uh, to you all and to everybody that's listening in uh, uh, on this panel. 
which I'm very delighted to share with my distinguished colleagues here from uh, from London. Uh, Middle East uh, has always been an important region. Uh, it witnessed the birth of civilizations, stood at the crossroads of all others. It witnessed the birth of the three monotheistic religions, and it remains the source of energy that fuels the world today. Uh, it simply is captivating, has been, and to my mind, will be for time eternal. Uh, the region is seen today as a region that is riddled with problems and fueled by sectarianism and burdened by havoc. This is truly undeserving for a youthful population of whom 75% are under the age of 35, looking for peace and security, looking for opportunity, jobs, raising their standard of living in a world that is ever more connected today than ever before. Modern day Jordan, born exactly 100 years ago, this year, under the Hashemite leadership, remains committed in its pursuit of peace in the region and beyond. His Majesty King Abdullah II is uh, probably the most outspoken statesman on Middle East peace. Peace which he asserts as both a basic right and a practical need for the people of the region. Is that doable? The short answer is yes. How is that doable is a question that actually begs an answer. The answer, and as my good colleague Tariq uh, referred to, is in ending the Israeli occupation and implementing a two-state solution for Israel-Palestine on the basis of the June 4, 1967 lines, Jerusalem as the capital of the state of Palestine. For peace to be comprehensive and for it to last, it must be accepted by the people, based on international law and legitimacy, as outlined in the United uh, Nations Security Council resolutions 242338 and the Land for Peace and Security Principles. And exactly as outlined in the Arab Peace Initiative of 2002, the Palestinian refugee problem is to be agreed upon in accordance with UN General Assembly Resolution 194. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict remains without a doubt the core conflict in the region and it fuels all other conflicts in the region. Remains remain unresolved. One would expect nothing other than a future that is bleak at most. For whatever short-term benefits of perceived stability will only be temporary. In the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, we remain committed to uphold, uh, to uphold our role as the custodian of the Islamic and Christian holy sites in Jerusalem. And we believe that weakening the presence of other religions and communities in the holy city goes against what it actually represents. It plays directly into the hands of radicals and haters. And it is something that we all don't want to see happen, nor we would appreciate. We definitely praise the efforts of our brothers in Egypt to bring about a ceasefire after the destruction that the world stood, stood witness to just recently. In Jordan, we remain fully engaged with our brothers and partners to restore calm, to maintain it, in order to, to produce an enabling environment for peace. For a military solution is never the answer. It can only impact the host of problems that the world is facing from displacement of people and the socio-economic problems associated with it to climate change. In Jordan, let alone the COVID challenge, the country has had to accommodate 1.3 million Syrians, representing an increase of over 20% of its own population in a span of two short years. We have had to accommodate 140,000 Syrian refugee children of school age in our classrooms. We have issued 270,000 work permits to Syrians, while we still have 24% unemployment rate. Despite these huge challenges, the country remains committed to its founding principles. Its values and tradition of being a, a ray of hope for a region and being a safe haven, offering refuge for those fleeing conflict, 
And I should like to know here, I should like to note here that we believe that refugees are real people with real problems and real needs, not just abstract figures and numbers. They are the collective responsibility of the international community and they deserve to live in dignity, away from despair and ignorance that are the best friend of an extremist. And of course, there are many problems and challenges that require global action. Another is climate change, the impact of which is, pain, is a painful reality and must be dealt with. It is a tran it's, uh, transforming parts of our landscapes and aspects of our ecosystem. In Jordan, the Dead Sea water levels have been shrinking at an average rate of one meter per year. And we have one of the lowest levels of water availability per capita in the world. Left undealt with, it will impact the country and all the people in it. Uh, therefore, Jordan has recently launched a national green growth action plan focused on green recovery from COVID-19 with measures to upscale energy efficiency, strengthen its resilience and adaptation in water and agriculture. I shall uh, end with a quote from His Majesty King Abdullah II, who said, an investment's success should, not, should no longer be measured merely through financial gains. Its environmental benefits and sustainability must be key, end quote. I think this also applies on all other aspects of our lives. And I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to a productive Q&A later on. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for these very powerful remarks. Um, yes, the conflict between Israel and Palestine and the solution for Palestine, I think, will underpin a lot of the um, the, the um, conflicts that are uh, still but, uh, happening in the Gulf, in, in, in the Middle East as a whole. And I absolutely um, agree with you that with the new administration in the U.S. coming in, perhaps a new administration in Israel coming in as well, maybe this is the time and all the dialogue that is taking place between Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Qatar, I Iran, maybe there is hope to see that in the next two to three years, some peace and stability will, 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 will revert back to the Middle East. But let me now invite um, um, our last of the ambassadors, um, but not the least, uh, Rami Murtada, who's um, the ambassador of uh, Lebanon to the United Kingdom. Um, Rami, Lebanon is, uh, to put it mildly, is in a mess. Um, we all know it. Uh, we all feel the pain of the people. So many of us have been there. Many of us have fantastic recollections of Lebanon as it used to be in the 50s and 60s and 70s. But let me ask you, um, given the change in demographics, is the Taif Accord still relevant? How can... Uh, Lebanon move away from sectarianism and rebuild a country that is united, that is cohesive um, and prosperous. Lebanon used to be the envy of everyone in the Middle East. Can it again find its mojo? Thank you, Mohammed, and uh, glad to share the panel with a group of uh, friends and fine experts in uh, Middle Eastern and global affairs. Uh, with regards to your question on, on Lebanon and the uh, Taif Accord, you mentioned the Taif Accord. <clears throat> For those uh, uh, unfamiliar with the Taif Accord, it's the agreement that uh, put an end to the Lebanese troubles, uh, as we call them, in 1990, and laid the foundations of the new Lebanese constitution, whereby a sectarian kind of sectarian distribution of powers was incorpor incorporated into, into the Constitution. At the time, the Taif Accord was conceived as a transitory period, which was supposed to prepare the country for the transition towards a more secular framework. And today, if you ask me, is this accord still relevant and still able to maintain stability in the country? My short and direct answer will be yes. Anything that meets inclusive approval in Lebanon is, is good for the, for the country. We live in a region where the rule of relativity, rel relativity is, is, um, is of utmost importance. 
And we need also to recognize that this uh, Lebanese political system, which was conceived uh, through the Taif Accord, carries answers to questions which are looming in the region and are still in, in many of its countries still unanswered. Questions, for example, related to representation of different societal um, uh, and uh, sectarian components within a unified state structure. I think this is a challenge facing the, the region at, uh, at large, and we need to recognize that the Lebanese political system has provided some, some answers to it, although not the ideal answers, but has provided some answers. Um, these uh, societal challenges, I think, will accompany the, the region for, for years to come. You can also think of our Lebanese political system as our own version of devolution. Instead of having regional or geographic devolution, as you would find in the UK, for example, we have adopted a system where devolution is more centralized in the decision-making process. This had um, a positive effects. Uh, it gave a space of tolerance and mutual acceptance to the political uh, culture in the country. And let's not forget also that Lebanon is the only Arab country where the head of state is of the Christian faith by constitution. Having said this, no constitution is ideal, and we should never lose sight of the need to evolve, always inclusively, within Lebanon towards a political structure, a political system that takes stock of the huge secular potential that, that exists in the, in the country. But in order to do this, we need also to be cognizant of the regional dynamic. We need a conducive regional uh, uh, dynamics. Identity politics is today the, the dominant trend in the region and beyond the region, and unless and until we manage to bring a regional order that unleashes the huge potential and addresses mutual concerns and find just and comprehensive solutions for chronic and more recent conflicts. Um, the question of Palestine was, was mentioned, and it is uh, the occasion to commend uh, Egyptian efforts. Uh, we've, uh, it's another outbreak of violence, which uh, luckily ended with a lull, but a lull is a lull, and uh, unless we immediately couple it with serious uh, conflict resolution efforts, I'm, I'm afraid this uh, we it would not it would only be um, a lull until the next round of, of violence uh, erupts. Uh, but to go back to the region, I think no country of the region can achieve uh, sustainable stability and, and prosperity unless there is this much aspired to regional order. I tend to look at the, at the region, uh, any region, but in this case the Middle East, as a construct with two levels. You need to start with a solid floor, which allows for a stable top floor. The top floor being the country floor and the ground floor is the regional floor. Unfortunately, today the, the regional floor lacks any inclusive and agreed order that is able to bring sustainable prosperity and stability to most of the, all, if not all, we, we've had uh, a glimpse of hope with the, with the UAE, which is uh, a success story in the, in the region. But it remains that the regional order is of utmost importance for sustainable uh, stability. This is, of course, not meant to scapegoat the region for any national shortcomings. Uh, recent developments have shown that Lebanon is overdue on serious and comprehensive reforms that can reconcile the country with its legacy and with its potential. And internship and entrepreneurship, and uh, its deeply rooted democracy. A combination of indigenous and external elements have contributed to what we're seeing today in Lebanon uh, through economic meltdown uh, that is coupled with an acute political and institutional crisis uh, currently striking the country. 
a perfect storm, if I may call it. Uh, you have the economic meltdown, the political crisis. Uh, you have the terrible blast that hit the Beirut seaport last August. You have also the spillover effect from Syria and all its manifestations and dimensions, i.e. Syrian refugees, constituting today one-third of the, of the population in, in Lebanon. Uh, its, other, uh, its other dimension, uh, the, the, uh, the loss of our export corridor towards the, the Arab world, which Syria used to represent, uh, you've got also all these regional cross-border uh, tensions, uh, and you need to add to it, uh, of course, the lack of an international vision for for stability in the region, as we only have been witnessing crisis management and reactive international efforts in the in the region. And today, I think that COVID brought a new given, which added up to, to the already existing one, which is that the world will be too busy to work for sustainable stability in the Middle East and the foreseeable future. Uh, so I think what we should hope for uh, are indigenous homegrown efforts, both at the regional level to construct this ground floor, and at the national level to pursue uh, nation building in each and every country. As I said, it's a region with a huge potential and there is no re reason why uh, it should be witnessing what it's, uh, it's currently uh, witnessing in terms of uh, crises, in terms of uh, tension and, uh, and, uh, and under, under development. I'll stop at that and looking forward for the Q&A. Thank you, Mohammed, again. Thank you very much, Rami, um, for um, charting that uh, course for for Lebanon back from the Taif Accords and still um, feeling that it still continues to play its role in, in, in hopefully stabilizing the situation there. Can I now turn to Jamie? Jamie um, has been um, in the Middle East and North Africa region as a diplomat for more than two decades, having served in Oman, in Bahrain, in Kuwait, uh, Iraq, Sudan. And so you've seen the use of hard power, you've seen the use of soft power, you've seen the use of diplomacy over this 20-year um, period. In your view, what has worked, what has not worked, and can is there still room for diplomacy in trying to solve some of these irretractable conflicts? And how do you go about doing it? Mohammed, thank you. And, and, and um, having been a diplomat for 34 years, you're not going to get an entirely unbiased answer to that question. Uh, I absolutely think there is a role for diplomacy. I was a, a soldier for seven years, though, so I, I've, got, I've got a little bit of balance. Um, but I think if one has a quick look at the recent history of the region, there are, there are a number of examples where diplomacy uh, has delivered results. Um, and, and thinking of some examples, um, I was the ambassador in, in Oman in uh, 2014, when the late Sultan Qaboos brokered direct talks between the United States and Iran uh, that led to the, the JCPOA. Um, and I think uh, at the time that was seen as a, a significant contribution to regional security, not by everybody, but, but, but by many countries. And of course, the JCPOA did not survive the, the Trump administration. Um, and it did not address some of the, the very legitimate worries of the uh, Gulf Arab states uh, about Iran's uh, destabilizing activity in the region. Um, but I feel nevertheless that if a new JCPOA could be attained, um, it would be uh, a, a contributor to, to uh, reducing the tensions in the region. And I, I should just add one reason why I think that's so important is if one looks around the region at the potential flashpoints for a new conflict, perhaps the most dangerous is the Gulf itself. And the, the danger of a unplanned, unintentional exchange of fire uh, between coalition naval forces and, and Iranian naval forces is constant and, and very dangerous. Um, but uh, uh, the other point I would would, would absolutely recognise is that JCPOA itself uh, is not going to uh, answer the concerns of, of others in the region about other aspects of Iranian policy. Um, Libya, uh, there's been a ceasefire there for 
about seven months now. It's it's held pretty well. Uh, there is a process leading to elections in December. Uh, and for the first time in many, many years, uh, the prospect of a stable, increasingly prosperous Libya is a real one. Uh, and that was achieved not by uh, fighting, uh, but by diplomacy. And I would just draw a contrast there with what may happen in Syria, uh, where one of the outcomes of the Syrian civil war, uh, an entirely possible one, I think, uh, is that the Assad regime uh, will uh, retake control of all of Syria uh, and that you will have stability, but it will be stability gained by brute force rather than by diplomacy. And I have to say, I think that uh, the uh, the prospects for the condition of the people of Libya uh, in their situation would be far, far more optimistic about this than I would be uh, of the prospects of the people of Syria in, in that situation. Uh, in Yemen, uh, I find it impossible to imagine that the tragedy of the war in Yemen and, and the threat posed to Saudi Arabia by, by the Houthis is going to be solved militarily. I think that is another conflict that, that uh, desperately needs a, a diplomatic solution. And I just think there are, there are, there are a couple of glimmers of hope there that the Saudis proposed a ceasefire a few weeks ago. Uh, there are signs of, of a thaw, uh, maybe in relations between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Maybe the pieces are, are shifting a bit there that, uh, that could be, we could be seeing a situation developing where uh, real talks towards peace might be possible. But uh, even if uh, all of these conflicts are solved, uh, even if uh, a JCPOA is achieved, uh, the tensions between the countries in the region and tensions within some of the countries in the region are going to stay dangerously high. And, and uh, Tariq and Rami have both spoken about the, uh, the essential importance of solving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, and I completely agree on that, although I, I would differ slightly that uh, whilst I think solving that conflict would ease some tensions and might make the resolution of some other conflicts easier, I fear that some conflicts around the region have a dynamic of their own, a complexity of their own, an involvement of outside parties that means that uh, solving Israel-Palestine wouldn't necessarily help to solve those. But I, I would stress that is not in any way to diminish the importance of working towards uh, of trying to take the peace process forward. Um, the other unresolved conflicts, Israel with its with its northern neighbours, uh, the Western Sahara. Uh, we we've heard how fragile uh, Lebanon is, Iraq is is fragile, and um, this new uh, and, and well not new now, but uh, this relatively new uh, and very serious danger that Globus mentioned of the competition for scarce water resources. And given the, the existential importance of water for any society, uh, that, that is a, a, a very dangerous source of potential conflict. But I, uh, I really could not agree more with Rami uh, when he spoke about the ground floor and needing to get the ground floor sorted out. And I think that may be the most important contribution that diplomacy can make because as I say solve all of these individual conflicts these individual fragile states uh, you still got an inherently dangerous situation and I, I can't see that being resolved without a strategic approach that embraces all region and has a long-term view and uh, it, it's it's an issue for, for, for a much wider discussion um, but the the idea of some sort of regional security framework uh, is, has been, uh, proposed in the past. Um, it, uh, it's to be effective. And again, this is not a new idea. Uh, it should include all of the countries of the region. So not just the Arab states, but also, uh, Iran, Israel and, and Turkey. Uh, it can be debated how many external countries should be involved, uh, as, as we've been discussing. The U.S. Uh, is less involved and less influential in the region now, but I think he's going to remain a very important influential player, probably the most important influential outside player there for some time to come. Uh, the Europeans, uh, the U.K., France, Germany, the European Commission, all, all co-signatories of the JCPOA, all have close relationships across the region. The U.K. and France have uh, close historical relationships with, with, with most of the countries in the region. 
Uh, Russia, very much present, with including with military force, very active in the region. Uh, China has a huge economic dependence on, on Gulf energy and again, is, is becoming increasingly active in the region. Um, it would be tempting to say uh, that, that all of us in the region, outside the region, share an interest, which is, is stability in the region. It may be being optimistic uh, that the, the, there is one would have to recognise a danger. If you manage to set up some kind of framework, it could just become another arena for, for world power competition uh, as much as, as for collaboration. Um, but I, I think it uh, that kind of regional approach will be essential to tackle these, uh, these long term issues. And it, it needn't and indeed shouldn't just focus on security and defence issues. Uh, and again, uh, uh, Rami touched on some of the, the regional issues that it might cover, but, but economic development and trade, tackling climate change, uh, and, and, and actually you know, now, and again, Rami touched this, uh, uh, collaboration in preparing contingency plans for, for pandemics and, and other catastrophes, all the sorts of things that everyone has an interest in doing. Um, and, and that are less contentious, perhaps, than the defence and security aspects. And indeed, if, 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 if these softer issues were focused on first, that could in itself be a useful confidence building measure for, for the other, the other issues. So I'll, I'll leave it there, Mohammed. Again, there's, there's, there's a, a lot more one could say on that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, so uh, sadly, we now have five minutes left of the official one hour that we have. We can continue, but I know some of you have got hard stops and other things you need to do. So um, I'm, there are so many questions that have come out from the very interesting and um, engaging points of view that have been shared here. But I think that um, in conclusion, let me ask our four um, ambassadors. Uh, you have here Jamie, Clovis and myself who are very much part of the British framework. And if there is one request that you would like to make of the British in terms of what they could or should be doing in the MENA region more actively, what is it that would be your ask? If you could each share a one minute request um, and then we can see um, how we, 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 we sort of take that forward. Who should we start with? Rami? Okay. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, well, I think a uh, very, very short and spontaneous uh, answer. I, I fully subscribe to, to what Clovis said on a sort of dilemma that the West and Britain, and, and Britain in particular, has uh, or, uh, when it comes to dealing with the, with the Middle East. Uh, because there were um, several um, uh, types of, of, um, of involvement, uh, they don't seem to have uh, worked. But I think one major um, contribution that the UK could have is to provide the wisdom and the knowledge of the region and designing the, this construct uh, that we, we, we spoke about, this regional construct, in a way that um, uh, provides win-win schemes for all the, the stakeholders uh, and guarantees the rights and obligations of all the countries of the, of the region. I mean, it's a region where I look at it as a building where the tenants don't have a management company or, or, or a platform where the neighbors can meet and discuss the, the, their issues. I think Britain should could could be uh, very very useful at providing the the intellectual uh, pillars for for such an international initiative to to this towards the region. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in your um, answers, also please comment on whether you feel that there would be um, uh, there is a need to have a new institution or a new framework that could help as well. Or is what we have today sufficient? Uh, Tarek. Uh, thank you, Mohammed. Um, very quickly, I know we're very pressed on time. Uh, just uh, two things, if I may. Uh, first, on the Middle East in general, I think there has been a, a consensus here that uh, uh, we need to uh, uh, take some uh, serious look on how to uh, uh, bring the parties back to the negotiating table in order to uh, uh, reach uh, a solution uh, to the Palestinian problem. Uh, there is also uh, an understanding now uh, 
good, and this is a good understanding, that the two-state solution uh, uh, must be uh, uh, looked at uh, uh, again in a serious manner. I think, in short, what I'm saying is uh, uh, we would ask uh, from the British, uh, since this was your question, uh, since the, the UK is hosting... Uh, 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 starting, I think, Friday, uh, the G7, maybe uh, something should be included uh, in the agenda or in whatever uh, conclusions is going to come out of the uh, G7 when it comes to the Middle East and when it comes to uh, the Palestinian problem. Uh, uh, stressing uh, the importance of uh, a peaceful solution and a two-state solution, I think, would be of uh, paramount importance. Uh, this is my first uh, point that I would like to make. This. My second point, and this is on the national level, and there has been uh, a couple of mentions on the uh, water scarcity. Uh, you all know, of course, the uh, problems that we are facing along with Sudan being the uh, two recipient countries uh, uh, down the Nile. Uh, 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 with regard to the uh, uh, Ethiopian uh, dam. Uh, there are two things here. Uh, uh, the, the uh, Nile for us is an existential issue. Uh, we have no other uh, water resource uh, other than uh, what is coming from the Blue Nile. 87% of our fresh water comes from the uh, Blue Nile, which will be adversely affected by the GERD if we do not agree on some kind of uh, 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 ways and means uh, uh, in a binding agreement on how to fill and operate this dam. Uh, so I also wanted to, to mention this because uh, I'm sure you are all uh, uh, following uh, the, uh, these negotiations or actually the lack of negotiations right now. Uh, 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 Ethiopia, unfortunately, is, is, uh, is establishing facts on the ground and is uh, continuing uh, to build the dam uh, regardless of uh, whether or not we reach an agreement uh, with Egypt or Sudan. Thank you. Okay. Um, Omar? Yeah. Uh, John, thank you so much uh, for this. Uh, the, the UK is uh, may not be a, a superpower in today's uh, measures, but it is still a very, very important uh, uh, player on, on the world stage. Uh, uh, unfortunately, there is uh, not a single uh, uh, coalition of sorts outside the uh, United Nations that uh, the UK is involved with uh, in dealing with the uh, with the Israeli-Palestinian question, which uh, and with reference to uh, what our friend Jamie said earlier, uh, it it might not automatically resolve all the other conflicts in the in the region, but it will for sure uh, enhance the level of communication that uh, states to states have, people to people have. Uh, it will definitely relieve uh, a lot of pressure uh, and it will uh, it will definitely uh, make us all uh, in that region uh, look with uh, with a w with a different fresh objective look at uh, at what is uh, happening with the conflicts around the region so so it is important and it, it does remain the 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 core uh, question it, it begs the attention of everybody uh, when when things uh, uh, escalate. It's uh, uh, anybody can can use the, uh, the the existing conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians and play on 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 the uh, emotional string, on the humanitarian string, on the religious uh, string. So therefore, it is uh, it is quite important to. Uh, to keep it at the forefront uh, of uh, of the agenda, and uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, dear Clovis, I, I don't believe that uh, people should uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, be responsible for the mistakes of their forebears, but uh, but we do have to uh, uh, we do have to start somewhere. And uh, we, 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 have, uh, we have to agree on a starting point and uh, agree on an end point and take it from there. Uh, because otherwise, uh, things will, will not change. And uh, uh, my dear friend Rami will not have his uh, first floor, uh, <laughs> nor, nor will we uh, witness uh, uh, a basement that is 
solid enough to cater for the uh, for the people of region who are really genuinely looking forward to to moving on uh, the region is is connected uh, to europe the region is connected to the west the region is connected to asia uh, and and uh, africa it's, it's it's everywhere and uh, in today's uh, uh, day and age uh, uh, information travels very quickly uh, we're witnessing a huge change in with the, with the social media with the uh, that is basically affecting mainstream media as 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 we all know it so so there are uh, there are points that uh, uh, the uk can can definitely uh, uh, make and uh, and make soundly and loudly and again thank you so much uh, for this and i look forward to seeing you in person soon in Abu thank you thank you Manchu, the last word is with you just just very quickly i won't add my colleagues have mentioned some very important points uh, in terms of how the uk can sort of play a greater role but i do think we shouldn't forget you know the integrated review, review and the defense command paper although uh, i think uh, to say it paid lip service was is a little too much i think there's there's a lot of thought that went into that very difficult to com- to compress that all into one document it's an important part but what we want the uk is now to deliver upon that to play its role as as a global britain you know that's where i think my colleagues mentioned the intellectual property the U- uk has and ties with the region you know that's where it can play a deeper role and we want it to deliver upon global britain it seems to be very uh, domestically focused at the moment so i think we need to uh, sort of all urge it to to deliver upon that and we have an elaborate strategy for that so uh, and we have the deep connections and friendships and thank you for the time uh, and opportunity to participate today so I think um, uh, we will now let this uh, bring to a close. I would like to thank each of you for taking the time in your extremely busy schedules to be here today and to answer questions, difficult questions. And I think I leave at least this panel feeling that um, there is hope, there is optimism. And I think with the right um, approaches by the Biden team, by the UK, by Europe, Um, Maybe this is uh, a turning point now to seeing how some of these irretractable conflicts can be at least solved and the consequences for the people of the region who have had so much suffering to endure over the years can be mitigated. So thank you very, very much um, for your time and your participation today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.